I'm going to just say a few words, and I have to, I have to profess an enormous <clears throat> sort of ignorance about architecture, so I'm going to say things that probably those of you who are architects are just going to go... Mm. But I have been talking to architects for the last few years because I love architecture, um, and I love cities, and I love space, and I love navigation, and I'm uh, always thinking about navigation and finding my way around the city and how... Uh, the architecture of the city does or doesn't facilitate that process. Um, and it feels to me that architecture um, really has not made contact with quite a lot of the work that's being done in the neuroscience and the psychology of space. So there are a lot of things that we've found out in the last few years that haven't made their way into kind of current practice. Um, so I'm going to briefly touch on what those are and I'll give you some thoughts that have arisen from talking to architects and trying to sort of see whether we have any common ground. I think we do have some common ground. So I've encountered two types of architects. So that's probably not fair. I mean, I've probably encountered lots of types of architects. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's probably, uh, it's probably a spectrum. But, you know, the mind likes to classify, and, and I've classified the architects that I've met into two types. So one type, um, I will typically have a conversation like this, you know, when I, when I ask them, how do, how do you design? How do you decide what to build? They say, you know, we've been doing this for years and years and years. We know what works. There's a huge literature. Um, and, you know, we are informed by um, our intuition and our experience and um, all of this type of stuff. And then I will say, like a typical scientist, you know, how do you know what works? Um, and then they'll say something like, we ask people, which, you know, is a, is a fair enough um, approach, I think. Um, but it's quite uh, to be contrasted with something that's more familiar to me as a scientist, which is um, you measure things. So you don't just ask people, um, you measure things. And the reason is that if you ask people how they think or how they feel, um, you may not be asking the right people, you may not be asking enough people, people may not give you the right answers. So people may not know themselves how they do things or how they feel or why they feel the way they do and so on. Um, so I think of the first type of architect as the intuitive architect, um, <clears throat> working on the basis of the, um, the human mind's very capable ability to assimilate very complex information um, and think holistically about things. And then the other type I think of loosely as analytic. So people um, who think more like scientists and engineers who collect data, um, test hypotheses and all of those types of things. So my feeling as a neuroscientist is that in order to be able to design architecture for humans, we need both types of approach. Intuitive design, I think, can be more freeform and creative. So I, I think, I mean, I love engineers dearly. I'm married to an engineer and so on. Um, engineers are what keep us alive. Um, <coughs> engineers are the reason that we're not in caves and so on and so on. But engineers don't always have... Um, an understanding of beauty and aesthetics and all of those things that make architecture, architecture. On the other hand, they make us safe and they make buildings that are useful. So, um, so, so I, I think intuitive design is really, really important. But I also think that analytic approaches um, <clears throat> allow us to really properly ask questions about what things work and what things don't work. And my experience as a user of architecture is that there are a lot of things out there that don't work very well. Um, I'm constantly being frustrated by um, buildings that I can't find my way around in. I come, I, I enter a train station or I come up, up out of a train station and I think, I have no idea where to go. I have no idea where to go. I look around, everything looks the same. I am so confused. Um, I go to a conference center, which I do frequently, and I know I need to get to symposium, you know, C.301, and I think, where is that, you know? Um, where am I? Which way did I come in? I can't even work it out. So often, and I think my experiences are common, I think um, there are many buildings that are built um, that may win awards for their aesthetic design, but they don't really engage with the way that human psychology apprehends space in order to navigate. So navigation is just a really important kind of thing. Um, so, and then the other thing about the more analytic approach is that you could, once you understand why something works, you can then run with that. You can then extend into new realms that you might not have thought to go into until you understood the why and the wherefore. So I, th I think you need both approaches. And I think 
My understanding of architecture um, historically is that it's been more on the intuitive side, but I think in the last few years I've got the sense that the new generation of architects are also engaging really a lot with uh, more analytic approaches. And so it seems to me as a psychologist that what we need to be doing is to, is to be integrating our psychology with that more analytic approach. Because we as a discipline have also moved from the more intuitive understanding of how people think and feel to more analytic approaches to how they think and feel. Um, so psychology deals with um, how people perceive the world, how they think about the world, and um, how they uh, emote about the world, have, you know, form emotions, and then what they do, how do they act in the world. And it's, <clears throat> psychology has taught us some really interesting things. So for example, in the realm of perception, which is a pretty simple thing, um, I'm sure that you're aware of these perceptual um, things that come along and challenge us every now and then, like the um, obviously white and gold dress that took the world by storm a, um, a year or so ago. Um, and that, that um, viral meme, which pr pretty much everybody knows, it really exercised a lot of psychologists. And psychologists were very quick to explain why that happens. Um, another example of um, a perceptual kind of puzzle is the thing on the right. So if you look at the square that's labeled A and the one that's labeled B, they have exactly the same um, luminance. So if you took a little square of them and just looked at them side by side, they're exactly the same. But our minds don't see them as the same. We see A as dark and B as light. Um, and there are many, many examples like this. And the reason is that um, perceptual psychologists and neuroscientists have discovered that um, primary perceptual areas in the brain are not just receiving the information that comes in, but they're modulating it based on things that the brain already knows and, and expectations that the brain has. Um, and so, for example, you... Uh, perceive the intensity of the, the luminance of something based on what you think the lighting is. And that's why people saw the dress in two different ways, because people were making two different assumptions about the lighting and so on and so on. So once you, once you understand why these things are happening, that you can then either not fall into traps or you can start to exploit that and kind of play with it a bit. Um, <clears throat> the other area that's really opened up a lot in psychology in the last few years is our understanding of spatial perception, which is obviously relevant to architecture. Um, and I'm not going to talk very much about that because I, I talked a lot about it on Monday, and I think the video is going to be around if anyone is interested. But um, that's, the, that's the area that I work on. So I, I work on how the brain um, forms an internal representation of space. And much of our understanding of that has come from studying rats and mice, actually. So the, the big discovery that opened up this whole area was the discovery um, from John O'Keefe at, at UCL who was studying rats and discovered that there are neurons in the brain that become selectively active when the rat goes into a particular place. And he uncovered this whole system in the brain that's for navigable space. So um, it, it's essentially a mental map. And then neuroscientists found other ways of looking at the system. So for example, the neuroimaging, so the um, the, the, brain, the, the brain scanner picture at the top there is showing some of the um, parts of the brain that become activated when you're navigating or thinking about navigating and, and so on. So there's a now an enormous literature on the brain circuits involved in understanding space. And we've learned all sorts of things. Like, for example, uh, the, the part of the brain that governs your... Um, spatial action within reachable space is different from the part of the brain that governs action in space that you walk through, um, which may be different again from space that you fly through or drive through or something like that. So there are multiple brain systems for space and we're now starting to understand how they work, what types of information that they're interested in. So it turns out, for example, that they're not all interested in all types of information, only some things, for example, um, will engage the compass system in the brain. So if you want your people to be oriented as they're walking through your space, you need to give them that type of compass information. They may not respond to a sign that says north. They may only respond to you know, some other thing. So really, we um, have found out an awful lot now. Um, and we are hoping that this will start to find its way into things like architecture. So this evening, what we're going to do is we're going to, as I say, look at the methods of data con collection. I think not so much in the neuroscientific domain tonight, but just in the general domain of um, collecting data about how people behave in the world and the 
um, things that we can learn from studying, for example, large numbers of people, flows of people through spaces, um, where they behave the way that you might expect and where they violate your expectations and do something different, try and understand the uh, rules that people use, the heuristics that they use, the shortcuts that they take, and so on, and so on. Um, and then try and uh, use that to make a more kind of quantitatively informed approach to architecture, essentially. That's how I see it. And then finally, just before I um, get off, <laughs> I just wanted to say that, um, that I um, am engaged in trying to get people who are interested in navigation from as many disciplines as possible um, into the one forum. And so I've created this forum. It's called Cognav. It's a little um, branch of the Royal Institute of Navigation. And we're trying to get architects and designers and uh, engineers and uh, psychologists and everybody who's interested in navigation um, and find a sort of platform within which they can interact. So if you are interested in being part of our community, um, please let me know, and I'm very happy to uh, add you.